We just want to talk about what's going on with the North American Mission Board, your vision right. for us <clears throat> reaching North America, who's your one. So I'm just going to kind of let you take the conversation wherever you'd like to go, but you might just at least tell the students right now and our, our seminary family just kind of what are you excited about with the North American Mission Board right now and what's happening there? Sure. I want to say, too, thank you for changing the format. And it was very gracious to invite me to, to preach. And uh, But I really want to spend time to share my heart talking to you about taking your next missional step. If uh, you were to look at the NAM logo, it looks like three bars. And it, the whole idea is it's three pews, and it's getting people out of the pew and on mission. The whole thing is about getting people to take their next missional step. You're preparing for ministry as you go into to missions or to pastorate. And uh, whatever area you're in, you're always going to be in the process of taking people to point A, to point B, hopefully to point C, to D. You're walking them to where they need to be and uh, helping them take that missional step. And so today, I just want to be very direct in how you can do that, but hopefully how you can lead your people to do that. And so at the North American Mission Board, it's about coming alongside pastors. Pastors are our number one customer. And we come alongside pastors to help them, help their people take that first missional step. You'd be surprised in the Southern Baptist Convention, there are 46, 47,000 churches um, that's what they say. I'm not in charge of counting them. I don't, I don't know if I believe all that. But, they, but 46, 47,000 churches. But we have 10 to 15,000 churches that don't baptize one person and, and, or give one cent to missions. And so we have a tremendous need. When you go to a church, don't just assume they're going to be missions-minded. Um, you, you have the blessing of coming to a seminary that's very missions minds all about go and not every church is is like that and sometimes it's you have to take very elementary steps in helping them do that and what we're really excited about is how how god is doing some tremendous things in the most unlikely places clint just shared about uh, a church right in the shadow of uh, nat park also one of our very best church plants in san francisco um is right right by giant stadium kevin how many sin cities is uh, the North American Mission Board uh, spotlighting and highlighting right yeah, now? Yeah, it's basically every major city, and it's send with a D. Uh, uh, these, uh, uh, what we're trying to do is focus on the high population areas. We have 32 of those, but then also uh, we have a send focus areas like collegiate church planning. One of the hottest things we have right now are, are planning churches on college campuses intended to reach the community, but also that college campus. And then we do military church plans literally all over uh, the world. 85% of military live off base. We're not convinced that we'll be able to have military chaplains uh, much longer, and so we're planning churches by all the bases so that we can still minister to those uh, on those military bases. But the reason we went to the cities is because uh, that's where we're weakest. As a Southern Baptist family, we're weakest. 85% of Southern Baptists are in the South. Um, and, and that's why we're focusing this SEND network. The SEND network is the church planning arm of the North American Mission Board. is focused on the Northeast, the Midwest, West, and Canada. Because that's where the majority of the people are. 85% of, of, of Southern Baptists are in the South. We often tell folks, look, 85% of Southern Baptists are in the SEC and the ACC. It's the other conferences that are going to hell, and we have got to reach them, all right? <laughs> And so the whole purpose of that is so you can get a visual, that is the case. We don't have our strategic works in the Northeast, the Midwest, West, and Canada. And so we're purposely going to those high population areas. And if you turn over the back of USA Today, look at the weather page on there, it's every city on there minus Green Bay. And you say, why not Green Bay? Go there, you'll know why. So. I'm just kidding. Well, Kevin, uh, many of the students here would be encouraged to know that uh, one of our own, Michael Geyer, yeah. uh, who is a, uh, now an uh, ABD in his PhD, did his master's degree here, then his PhD, uh, is, has recently started, launched a church in Ann Arbor, yeah. uh, right there on the campus of the University of Michigan. Exactly. We have something we're starting uh, along with Who's Your One about Go To that J.D. Greer is helping us uh, launch nationwide. The whole idea is Go To is helping people when they graduate uh, to uh, go two years into a very intentional ministry. Uh, the, the beautiful thing about planting churches on these campuses, we have... Uh, um, the students, when they graduate, I just met with 20 students at Iowa State um, a few years ago. They were, um, uh, and they produce probably more than anyone right now as far as multiplying themselves, even more than any of our Christian colleges. Um, 
they intentionally graduate people out to go and be missional. I met with 20 students. They were all going to go to the, uh, I believe it was Michigan. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Wisconsin. They were going to go to the University of Wisconsin and plant a church. They'd all, they were going to graduate in May. They all had jobs there and we're gonna move there and come alongside a church planner. And my, my point is this, what we wanna see is every college graduate understand that you don't have to be a church planner. We'd love for you to consider it if, if God's gifted in that way. But you can go and come alongside a church planner very intentionally. And so uh, we're just asking them to commit two years once you graduate. If you wanna be, I, I was on Auburn's campus uh, just a few weeks ago and, and talked to about 200 um, um, uh, engineer students and I said look I, I'm not trying to talk you out of being an engineer be an engineer but but when you graduate go to Pittsburgh go to Philadelphia go to LA and we can give you a list of church planners to come alongside and join and be on that church planning team could you talk about it being out of being Auburn fans I, I think that would be a good thing <laughs> that if uh, some of them could do yeah it's, it's exactly I'm, I'm from Kentucky you know we, we Y'all don't have a football team we go silent during football yeah. yes you do football's an appetizer waiting for the big big <laughs> season to come you know basketball so. so in essence you're saying to our college students though you don't have to be called to be a pastor or even a staff person you graduate you want to come alongside find a job in one of these places right you can be a part of a team and aren't the teams much more successful when you have a group going exponentially much more successful and um you may not realize this but over 50 percent of our church planners are bivocational and if you go even to alabama and arkansas and georgia over 50 percent of the pastors in the sbc in those states are bivocational so the very best thing you could do is to equip yourself for a vocation and then intentionally, we have one of our best church planners in Florida is a surgeon. Uh, his name's Marino. And I, when I was there with him, he had a surgery that morning, left, cleaned up, preached, and then went back and checked on his uh, patient that afternoon. I mean, it's incredible. We have right now a, a school teacher in New York makes $95,000 a year and is planning a church in, in New York. So, uh, yeah, if you're in, in college, be, just be very intentional with uh there, there's so many doors open and uh, what we're trying to do now is to to locate internships throughout north america uh, that uh that that you can be a part of say like your junior after your junior summer uh, you could spend time in that internship we found once we get a student on site in a city there's about 35 percent retention rate and so that's why if you're if you have a summer free uh, we would love for you to be a part of gin Sand, something we do it's where uh, you go for six to eight weeks in a city and we have about uh, like i said about 35 to 40 percent retention rate in some of the cities um, that they want to return and be a part of that city and and i just want to encourage you if i can get a little quick plug in here if if you text the number 888-111 and just text on mission to 888-111. It'll come up with several different options and ways that you can plug in at the North American Mission Board. It's not about plugging in at the North American Mission Board, but we showing you how you can plug in all across North America, whether it be a church plant, that's through Send Network. And then on the other side of NAM, we have something called Send Relief. And that's the compassion mercy side of, of what, what we do, where we try to help people uh, that are in impoverished situations. We have sex trafficking uh, ministry centers, adoption and foster care. We have uh, a whole crisis response uh, area. And then we have a minister to, a minister to internationals and refugees. And we have uh, ministry centers all over North America that you can be involved in. And what we found is that's really the very best front door for many of our church plants. And they found if they invest in the city, you've got to, you have to invest and love the people and then the doors begin to open. One of our best church planters in Boise, Idaho, uh, just got online and organized. There's this big mountain in Bo Boise that overlooks Boise. You can see the blue football stadium from there. It's a pretty cool viewing point. But some people had a really messy up and trashed it and there was an article about how all the vandalism happened on this mountain well the planner got an idea he got online and organized a cleanup day on the mountain and had over a hundred people show up at that cleanup day and he won citizen of the month in Boise his first month there and then and, and he did it all online. He didn't know anybody and got all these people to show up and pick up trash. And, and that's what really helped launch his church was just a creativity of meeting a need. And again, that's just a so much important part of what you're doing here. I'm so grateful that you're here and you're, you're incredibly blessed to be here. 
and, and, and draw as much out of this experience as you possibly can. I look back and it's some of the most, I mean, it's some most fun and blessed days of my life were some of those preparatory uh, days. But when you leave here, um, you can't hide certain things. And one of the blessings that, that you have by being here, and I'm not blowing smoke, because uh, Danny is, well, Dr. Aiken's one of my favorite, favorite people. He really Charlotte is, but Danny's married to her. So um, <laughs> the, the beautiful thing that, that, that Danny and Charlotte model for you is genuineness. And you don't have that in ministry. There are a lot of people who have a lot of theology that, 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 that know their theology systematic. They, they have a lot of uh, uh, brain knowledge. But to be genuine in how you love people. And, and when you leave here, when you graduate from here, you can't fake it. And I see guys with degrees that are smart that try to fake loving people. And, and I mean, it doesn't matter if you're in Boise or if you're in Washington or you're in New York. Uh, people know authenticity and if you really love them or not. And so man, I pray you graduate the degree, but I also pray that you, you also um, uh, take on what you're being modeled here of the authentic authenticity of just genuine love for people. And what I found in ministry, you know, um, I was just telling some uh, hunt scholars this morning. I've, um, I, was all, I was a little intimidated. I'm not used to speaking to accelerated students, and it just made me nervous. <laughs> but that's speaking from a 2.4 GPA, I'm always real nervous in these settings. But, uh, um, you know, what, what I, was, I was telling them, if you love people and you work hard, um, you're, people will give you a good bit of grace. And, uh, and, you're, and you're preaching. You try the best you can. You may not be your best gift, but if you love people and you work hard, uh, they're going to give you grace. They just want to be loved, and they want to know that you're busting it. And Kevin, what you're saying to us is there is just a wide field of opportunities for people that have a heart to reach the cities. They can be called as a pastor to be a lead church planner, but they can be doing a thousand one other things. As long as they have a heart and a love for people, there's a place for their service through the North American Mission Board. Ab absolutely. And that's what we're trying to do. We, we, uh, we look at ourselves at NAM like uh, eHarmony Go Missions, all right? <laughs> and, and so what we try to do is take, if you're open, you have a willingness uh, uh, to be used, then we also will try to connect you with a missional opportunity somewhere. And so we can, uh, through just that text, we can start walking. So where, where would you be open to? Anywhere? Okay, then here are all the opportunities. You really have a preference for the West. Here are all the opportunities. The Northeast, here's all the opportunities. And we just try to connect you with the next uh, missional opportunity. And uh, there, there are, there's so many. And do not limit yourself saying, you know, I, I only do this or that. Everything should be on the table. You'd be, you'd be amazed at some of the, the, the walls that have come down and the creative ways that God has allowed us to do some things. It's just, it's just amazing. Now, Kevin, we meet here in a beautiful, traditional uh, auditorium with right. a high steeple. Right. Uh, that's not the future of the church in North America, especially in the cities, is it? No, not at, not at all, because one, there's not property to, to even purchase. Um, we were trying to find that. Even in San Francisco, one of our, um, one of our best church plants, they run about 800. They have three services, and, and they have... Uh, you know, it seats maybe 300. They, they, the rent on that is 40000 a month. And uh, it's just absolutely astronomical. You say, well, it'd be cheaper to buy it. Well, you think, um, you know, $25 million, um, is what would help us get something there. I, I'm trying to buy a synagogue in Montreal right now for about eight. Eight million, and because you can't, it's, the problem in Canada is uh, you can't. They won't. They won't. They don't have it where you can't even build a religious. It's not. Um, what am I saying? Um, not coded. They don't have the you, permit. the permit. You can't get a permit for religious. So we, we're trying to buy those that exist right now. But it's amazing the opportunities. Again, up in Maine, Augusta, Maine, uh, the Catholic Church in Augusta, Maine went belly up. Well, we had a church plant there uh, named Dan Coleman, a church planter. I met him in Florida at one of those little church, uh, one of those associational missional uh, flea markets, you call it, where they have all the different things out there. I said, hey, man, tell me about your church. And he said, uh, well, um, he showed me a picture of it. It looked like a two-car garage. And I went, my word, how many can you get into that? And he said, about 70. And I said, 70? How many do you run? He said, 200. 
I said, 200, how do you do that? He goes, we have three services. I said, do you have three services in a two-car garage? He said, yes, the best we could do. We have nowhere, nowhere else to, uh, to worship. And I said, well, what are you going to do now? And he said, uh, we really don't know. He said, there is a Catholic church in town that went belly up. They have an auditorium that seats 500. But, um, there, you know, we, I have all my people are new believers. Out of the two, the majority are new believers. We don't know exactly what, what to do. And so, long story short, I go back to NAM. We have a properties department at NAM where we try to help planters get into properties at low percent or zero percent if possible. I said, hey, call Augusta, Maine. Call the Pope and see how much he wants for that Catholic church. <laughs> and, all, they, and, and offer him as low as you possibly can. So they come back to me and they say, look, he want, they want 1.8. And I said, well, offer him the lowest amount you possibly can with good conscience. And, uh, and so they offered him $400,000 cash. And they took it. I know, I couldn't believe it. I called some churches and said, hey, I called some pastor friends of mine. I said, I need you to help me uh, namatize this thing. <laughs> so we call it namatize. That means taking out the fountains and the statues and those type of things. And, uh, and we flipped it. And now Dan has, has been there uh, for a couple of years now. And they run over 1,500. And he just sent me a picture last week. He said, look, I'm baptizing my one. I'm baptizing my one. And so it's just incredible. Well, my point is, he's in Augusta, Maine. He was working maintenance at an apartment complex, trying to plant a church and a two-car garage. And God can take that and now uh, bless it far beyond what he could ever dream. And um, so, um, you know, I'm so, I'm just, it's just amazing me how God opens Doors. I mean, uh, when I was in seminary, I got my very first church voted me in seven to zero. And I didn't, I wouldn't even intend to be a pastor. I was going to be a student minister, but they said, hey, they, they, they would pay 150 a week and I need the money. And so um, I said, I'll pray about it. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and they couldn't get anybody else to do it because it's in a high crime area. And uh, seriously, I mean, when you say they voted me in seven to zero, it's my only unanimous call. And people often make fun when they hear seven to zero, you think not much influence, but that's not true. We were, we actually were on national TV. Um, we were on a show called Cops. What you gonna do when they go for you? <laughs> you heard? They actually did, seriously. We were on there twice. And, uh, and uh, we, people would break into our church so much that we put a sign on the front door that said, door open, come in. <laughs> and, and, and because they would break it down, get in there and like, there's nothing in here, you know? And so our, our, replacing those doors got expensive so we put that sign on there and the only thing we had in there worth anything was an organ you know and I wanted them to steal it you know and so so let's talk about who's your one what yeah. was the genesis of that and how would you talk to us as a seminary we're again I, I we're not taking the place of the local church that's not our calling right but we can come alongside the local church with an emphasis that I think has really taken off across the Southern Baptist Convention through the North American Mission Board's focus on who's your one. Yeah, it's incredible what God has done with who's your one. Um, uh, J.D. Greer, when he was elected president, said, look, I, I really have a passion to do something in my church where we try to get people to, to have a one. And uh, what if we were to make this a national thing? I said, man, that's a fantastic job. I, I find any idea I can and throw gas on it, and uh, and and that that's that's what happened. We talked to Johnny Hunt, um, who is a very uh, close friend of Southern uh, Southeastern Seminary, and uh, Johnny had just brother Johnny had just come on staff at the North American Mission Board, and he actually preached a sermon ten years ago on Who's Your One, and and uh, I did a whole series on Who's Your One. So it's something been around for a while, um, and uh, but we took JD's idea and put through our marketing department and came up with a strategy to, to make it a thing in the SBC. And man, God has really, uh, I really believe, anointed it in a great way. And it helps to have guys like Dr. Greer and, and Johnny uh, uh, stirring the dust uh, of trying to get people focused on back again on sharing their faith. We just lost a sense of focus on doing that. And uh, that's what's really been the, the biggest blessing of it. So basically the goal is for you to have somebody in your life that is lost, right. that you are building a relationship with, right. that you love, that you care for, that you're praying for, and that you intentionally are going to share the gospel with. Right, exactly. And and uh, mine's name's Chris. Um, and uh, 
what I found is uh, I started asking pastors, hey, what, what, when you share your faith, what do you use? And I'm always amazed by the stutter and the pause. Uh, because I have to try to think of what you mean. And they have been so long since they've shared their faith uh, that it's not something that just, when I mean what you use, I mean, it may be faith, F-A-I-T-H, years ago, or it may be the four spiritual laws, or, or I mean, what is it, your own personal testimony? What is it? What the Roman kind of road. Tool? Yeah, and, and today, typically, three circles, I'm a bit biased, but three circles tends to be the, the dominant, the easiest one. And it was real funny, I was at an um, educational institution, not long ago, this uh, student come up to after he goes, um, do you stand behind the three circles of evangelism tools? Well, yeah, we produce it. So yeah, I stay behind it. So he goes, well, don't you think, uh, don't you think it's a little theological light? And I said, um, please tell me that did not happen here. No, no, I just got here, but, uh, <laughs> but I'm, plus, I'm trying to prevent it happening again after this. Thank you. Know? you. But he, I said, theological I said, did you realize that uh, the guy who wrote that, Jimmy Scroggins, uh, has a Ph.D. in evangelism? Um, he has a degree that, that, that you're trying to get, uh, you know. And so uh, uh, it's just amazing. Uh, uh, anyway, I thought. So, so is the gospel, like, complex? Well, that's what I was trying to explain to him. It's like, look, it's, it, it, we're trying to help reach people who know nothing about it. You've got to have some type of ramp here, you know, but what we have to, what I found is we, we go back to 47,000 churches. We don't have our pastors focusing on sharing their faith. And the one thing about going to NAM, I've kind of gone, I've shifted into a wholesale uh, ministry where, you know, when you're in the church, it, you, you're getting to connect with people. And where I'm trying, I say host, I'm trying to connect with pastors who connect with people. And what we found, the best way to get this going is really, to, if you got to get the pastors excited. I never dreamed part of my job at the North American Mission Board would be to um, beg pastors to share their faith. And we've got to be, we've got to be intentional every day. It's much like, I love the story in Mark chapter 2 where those four guys bring the paralytic to Jesus and they do everything possible to get their friend to G Jesus where they even dig a hole in the ceiling, drop him down so that they could get their friend to Jesus. I love the intentionality of that. You know, we don't know those four guys' names. We have no idea what their names are, but we do know the passion of their heart and the passion of their heart is whatever it takes. They're gonna do whatever it takes to get that friend to Jesus. We've gotta have that type of uh, intentionality and honestly, a sense of urgency about it. And, and that's why we talk about missions. And, and when you leave here, um, plug in with the North American missions or international, if you, if you can't meet our qualifications, then perhaps you can go with the IMB. Um, uh, it, it, it was a joke. Don't be, be it's a joke, all right? <laughs> they're, they're, they're sensitive, all right? But, but seriously, it's not about then. It's more about now and how you can plug in now in ministry. Kevin, I'm sure you found out because you work with pastors so much, and I, we try to communicate this to the men that are going to be pastors here. Uh, what you are passionate about and what you're excited about and what you're intentional about, in time, your people will follow through in your footsteps. And if you're not excited about reaching the lost, they're not going to be excited about reaching the lost. If you're not excited about international missions, they're not going to be excited about international missions. Right. They take on the personality of the pastor. They really, they, they really do. And, uh, and they easily follow. I, I'll never forget, uh, uh, we used to teach uh, different, as you know, we taught a lot of different ways to share your faith at Highview when, when you guys were there. And uh, one was the faith, F-A-I-T-H. And I remember I had a lady, there was a, her name was Sherry, she's in her 60s, and she's, uh, every area you go to minister, every church you go to minister, you're gonna have her show up at your church. It would be a different name, but you're gonna have somebody who's a little persnickety, um, sarcastic, hard to deal with. Well, that's her. And so, I mean, for Pastor Appreciation Day, I just ask that she not come, you know? And so <laughs> she's that woman. So uh, she said, all right, Pastor, I I'm going to go, I'm going to go through faith, but I'm going to learn it, but I'm not going to share it. And I'm like, okay, I've just learned, you know, I had enough pastoral experience. You just kind of go with it. And so I said, okay, Sherry, whatever. And so she went to class, sure enough, first week, second week, she would not go out on visitation. We'd go to the class and then go on visitation and then come back and share. She'd and she'd go home. She just, 
Come to class, go home. Come to class, go home. Well, about the fifth or sixth week, I'm not sure what it was, but she finally came up and said, okay, okay, pastor, um, tonight I'll go, but I'm only going to do F. And it, F was for forgiveness, A is for available, I is for impossible for God to allow sin to heaven, T is for turn, and H is for heaven. And she said, I'll just do F, but that's it. No, no more, and then don't bug me about it anymore. I said, okay, I haven't bugged you at all, but I'll be glad you'd be glad to do F, that's fine. And so I set her up with one of our staff. I said, you take her, and we go in threes. And so they go to this house, and, and he said, you could tell right when they got there, the, the young couple was very, they were just very open and thrilled that they had come. And so they got in there, and he said, uh, in the com conversation, they got to the point of, hey, what would you think it takes for a person to go to heaven? He goes, well, we use something on our hand called F-A-I-T-H, faith. And he said, Sherry, why don't you just share with them what F stands for? And she says, sure. And she said, well, F is for forgiveness. You, you cannot have eternal life in heaven without God's forgiveness. And he said it was the wildest thing. When she said F, she got all this confidence, and she went straight to A. And she said, and, and well, in A, it's available. It's available for all, but it's not automatic. And then he said she got so excited, she went straight to T. And she said, and, 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 and T is for turn. Turn means repent. And oh, well, just forget it. Would you like to ask Jesus in your heart? And, and, and the, the, the dad said, or the father said, uh, you know, that's exactly what we'd like to do. And uh, at that point, Sherry turned to the leader and says, you pull it on in the garage. And, uh, and so... <laughs> and, and so he, he finished that visit out, and they come back to the church and began to share in the, you know, we do kind of a sharing thing, like you do at AA meeting or something. You know, come back and share about the, the visit. And, and so Sherry was saying, it was so exciting. You know, I, I did F, and, and, and then they, I could tell they wanted me to tell more, so I did A, and then I did T. And everybody was clapping for her, trying to encourage her, because they know she's kind of a pain. And, and, and then she said, no, but you don't understand. I didn't spell faith I spelled fat you know <laughs> uh, which is you know it's our whole point when you we read scripture like, it's not we don't go in our power we're going his strength and his power and it doesn't matter if you spell faith it doesn't matter if you spell fat it doesn't matter if you spell fa or foof it's all about being available and obedient and that's what we have to lead every pastor in the SBC to do and every member in the SBC to do and hopefully every student in every seminary uh, to be very intentional so I really want to encourage you to be a part of who's your one I already began he said well man I just don't know any lost people well shame on you you know there are plenty of them out there trust me and uh, uh, I just want to encourage you it's amazing how when you're open you when you're really open how God will bring those people in your path um, it wasn't longer I was I, I was really tired I'd gone to this place and was t teaching evangelism uh, 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 seminar it was actually in Houston I've been doing a thing about evangelism all day long and it was one of those times you get on a plane you know you're just worn out and you're thinking oh man just for an empty seat by me would be so nice you know and you get on there and and he sat down and there's I could tell it wasn't going to happen. You know, this guy was wanting to talk, and he said, hey, where are you from? And I said, Atlanta. Atlanta, where are you from? He goes, oh, I'm from here in Houston. And he goes, what brings you to Houston? And I said, well, I'm just doing a seminar, seminar. He said, seminar about what? And I said, uh, <laughs> a seminar about, oh, uh, we tell them about people. What, well, basically, we just, I was training people on what it takes for a person to go to heaven. And no lie, the guy says, well, hey, in your personal opinion, he said, in your opinion, what do you think it does take for a person to go to heaven? And so I was like, Mom, yeah, I shared with him. And sure enough, uh, uh, I kept up with him. And he eventually uh, did begin to attend a church and ultimately uh, came to know the Lord, not because of me, but just because he was really primed and ready and wanted to. And I'm just saying, I'm embarrassed to say I wasn't really a willing. I was kind of forced to do it because I had no other he, he basically did everything he did everything for me and uh but it's all about being obedient god will bring you those opportunities if you're just really open and intentional and looking for them all right we have just a few minutes left so here you are having been a pastor for a number of decades now over the uh, north american mission board for Nine 10 years, years yeah. almost 10 years now these students that uh, we sat there at one time 
What, what would you just say to them as we close out? If you could just kind of share your heart with them, mm. what would you want to say to them as they look forward to the ministry that God has for them as they look to the future? No, I appreciate that. Um, I would guard your heart. Um, a ministry can become a thing. Um, uh, and it's just important that you guard your heart. Uh, people can be uh, pretty cruel and, and me uh, in a church, even, in a denomination. It's, it's a cruel world, um, uh, and you just got to guard your heart. And the only way to do that is that personal time um, with the Lord. And, um, you know, you can, you can get so busy with certain things that you, f- you forget to do that. I stand uh, as a testimony of someone who has done it and someone who has, who has not done it at times. You go through different seasons. And, you know, when I first went to the North American Mission Board nine years ago, I, I thought it was going to go down. I really thought it was going to die. And, uh, um, you know, I got so focused on trying to help something survive that I didn't guard my heart like I, I really should or, or or even take care you know guarding my time with my family like I should and you get distracted on trying to accomplish something and you just forget the, the most important thing is to guard your heart so um, uh, that's the one thing you know I, I and I knew it when I was sitting where you are I was told that over and over again and there are certain seasons in my life where I've done it better than others but my word whatever you do is stay faithful but stay focused and it all starts it was an evangelist years ago um, Gypsy Smith said if you want to start a revival all you do it's real simple all you do is you go into a room all by yourself and you take a piece of chalk a piece of chalk a piece of chalk in a room all by yourself and you draw a circle on the floor and then get down on your knees in that circle and pray that God would start a revival in that circle and uh, I try to remind myself, you know, it really does start. You have influence to be able to do a lot of things. But, uh, you know, it rises and falls based on your heart. Um, we, had to let a, we had to let a missionary go today because of uh, some inappropriate financial activity. It's a small amount. $42.39. Um, alter a receipt. We had to, had to let them go because it's dishonest, but it's $42.37. Um, that didn't start uh, just overnight. It starts when you don't guard your heart in the small things. It's not the big things. It's the small things. And, um, and I just, I beg you, you spend a lot of your time and your family, perhaps resources, to get you to where you are. And uh, you can lose it. Uh, in a matter of seconds, uh, just enough to, time to write forty-two dollars and thirty-seven cents. So just be careful. Kevin, you're much uh, loved and appreciated here, and so I want to pray for you. And then our music team, our music team will come back up. But we are so grateful for the work you're doing there, and we are very excited about uh, doing Who's Your One here, and uh, excited about what uh, we're going to see the Lord do as we simply obey his command to share the gospel. So let me pray for us. Father, I thank you so much for Kevin and the great work that is taking place through the North American Mission Board. And Lord, we consider it an honor here at Southeastern and the churches that uh, are represented here to partner with the North American Mission Board in reaching this nation in Canada uh, with the gospel. And Lord, I take to heart what uh, Kevin has just said. Lord. May I guard my heart. May all of these men and women here, may we all guard our hearts that we would indeed be pure and holy vessels uh, drawn close to you every single day. And as a result of that, Lord, we just cannot help but tell others about the wonderful Savior who has invaded our lives, whose name is Jesus. So, Lord, as Southeastern launches, here's your one. Uh, May you bless it not in any way for our glory, but, Lord, for the good of those who are lost who need to hear of a Savior who loves them. And Lord, upon hearing that good news, they might indeed turn from their sin and put their faith and trust in the one who died in their place, paying in full the penalty of all of their sin.
So, Lord, as we now close this service by worshiping you in our singing, may we lift our voices high in praise to our King, the Lord Jesus Christ. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen.